Welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. I'm so pleased to have as my guest in this episode, Peter Golby, who talks about his new old album, Easy With The Heartaches. Now, Peter was the singer with Uriah Heep in the 80s, and he sang on three of their albums, Abominog, Head First and Equator. But in this interview, I really wanted to focus on this album, Easy With The Heartaches, because it's just absolutely incredible. And the fact it's remained hidden for literally all these years being recorded in the early 90s and the and the impact this album would have made if it had been released at the time. The songs, Peter's voice, the production, it's like one of the best melodic AOR albums you will ever hear. And what is so fantastic and lovely talking to Peter about this is is that after all these years, the album is taking off. He's getting inquiries and, and people talking to him from all around the world. And and so rightly he should, because this is an absolute masterpiece. Um, I've been playing it literally nonstop. Um, the, the tracks are, are just fantastic. The, every single song has got a, a absolute killer chorus, fantastic melodies, wonderful production. You know, the songwriting is just is absolutely top notch. Um, but as I, I talked to Peter over the phone at his home in Wolverhampton, and I just want to share this with you. And please, if you can, go and find the album and buy a copy yourself. So here's the interview with Peter. Well, well, Peter, uh, thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk to me today. And I and I wanted no to no problem at all. I wanted to I'm talk thrilled. to you. I can't tell you. Um, I mean, uh, because you've been in bands yourself, you'll, you, I'm sure you'll understand. It's just knocked me for six. <laughs> well, it, you know, I was banging my head against the brick wall for so so long, and then basically I had to stop. I couldn't hang on any longer. Um, and then all this, all these years later, yeah. it's like what? And it's worldwide, Phil. Yes. It's everywhere: <laughs> America, Australia, Japan, Russia, of all places, all over Europe. And I'm thinking, this is just incredible. So, what, what a gift at my age. I'm, sem- I'm 72 in a couple of months. <laughs> Well, Peter, Peter, you deserve this because you hear so many times in music, oh, there's an undiscovered or an unreleased album in the vaults or something, yeah. and you think, no, oh, okay, that might be interesting, and it sometimes comes out in a box set, and you and you listen to it and you think, well, I know why that was um, left alone, or I, I, that was a band like coming apart and they yeah. haven't really got any ideas. Your album, Easy with the Heartaches, is nothing like that. It is the, it is probably one of the best AOR melodic rock albums I've ever heard. It's like, it's, it's like discovering gold. It, wow. it's, it's a fantastic album. I mean, uh, you know, it, it just, every, every single track, and it's not just, I'm not just saying that because of how the, the, so the songs hang mm-hmm. together and the continuity, but the vocals, the, the, how the songs sound and, how I can imagine those songs could have been performed by, I can imagine Lou Graham from Foreigner singing them, uh, Tina yeah. Turner. I know that you, you wrote a couple of songs, did you, with her in I mind? I did, I did, yeah. Um, but, but, but it, 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 it all became clear. After I left the band, I got more time. Though. Yeah. And, I, and, and instead of thinking, well, I'll, I'll, I've always written songs. Yeah. And I've written some shit. <laughs> and I've written some, but it, suddenly I've said this in so many interviews. It all suddenly became very clear to me. It's a, it's like the beginning of the Wizard of Oz when he goes to color. It's yeah. Just, it's a sim, it was as simple as that. I started writing really good songs after. I mean, I wrote good songs whilst I was with the band. Yeah. And what was a shame was Equator, which was the last album I did with the band, and the production... I won't say the production's awful, because I don't want to blame Tony Platt, because he's got a story to tell why it sounds awful. He he reckoned that they lost their actual master. Yeah. And he said that mix that they put out was nothing to do with him. It's somebody just sticking the faders up and trying to keep themselves from getting the sack. Now, I don't know what went on, but um, 
that was part and parcel of why I quit. I'd had enough of the touring anyway. It was yeah. incredible. We were so popular. We we did crazy. We, we did things like twenty two countries in thirty days. I can remember that. I can remember doing sixteen nights back to back all over Europe. I can remember doing thirty six shows in forty two days in Australia. <laughs> and I thought I can't keep doing this. It's just it's crazy. Was Absolutely there, crazy. Was Jerry Bron still uh, behind it all then? Or was he, had he moved on or, or you left him? Well, I didn't even realise, because I walked away completely, but um, Bronze went b- b- um, bankrupt. Yeah. He, apparently he started an airline. I didn't even know that he wow. started an, aer- an airline. And he pumped a lot of money into that and it all went upside down. And, um, and that was the end of it. Because uh, for the... Uh, um, Abominog and Head First were both bronze. Then they went bump, and then we signed to, for Equator, we signed to CBS, a part of CBS which was called Portrait. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And the guy that signed us was a big fan. What was that band that did a song called Kites? I can't can't remember, but I, th- I think you. I know I've, I've I've read in other interviews where you don't like um, Equator because of the sound, but I have to say because it got great reviews at the time. I, I, I love the songs. Yeah, and I think it's I, a I good album. I love most of them anyway. Most most of that album was just me and John Sinclair. Um, but this, it's just you can't listen to it. But what is really strange, Phil. Because a lot of people now have got the, 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 their iPhones and they listen to music on their iPhones. Yeah. And because there are so many overdubs and, the, and as I say, the, the, so much um, reverb. Yeah. Everything was completely swamped in reverb. And I was reading the other day, it's almost becoming quite popular to like Equator these days. And I can only put that down to, because if you play it on a, a full stereo system it's a bloody mess yeah but if you play it on your phone it, it sounds, sounds good. good I mean there was a lot of reverb in the 80s to oh, be fair God. <laughs> I mean Lee's drums just completely dominate <laughs> everything but anyway that was then but as I say after I left um, which would be 86 um, I was right at, I was writing all the time. And I'm, when I say all the time, I'm talking about six, seven days a week. And yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd do it all day long. And I got into a situation where instead of thinking, I'm going to finish this song today, I thought about it and I thought, well, I'm not going to fi- If I finish it today, it's fine. And if I don't, I'll just leave it. And I, and I used to go and walk around the park and think. Jimmy Lee was a very, very close friend of mine, Slade. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot from Jim, just, just talking to Jim. Yeah. And um, so I had a call from Mickey Box when they were doing, um, what was the album after me? Uh, that was Raging Silence, was it? Yeah, Raging Silence. Yeah. And because uh, we didn't fall out, there was no falling out. I just said, I'm, I'm quitting, I can't keep doing this. Um, but as I say, the final nail in the coffin was Equator. Um, when we got off the plane in Australia and we were met by our record company who didn't even know we got an album out. <laughs> oh, God. And I thought, I'm, I can't, can't keep doing this. Yeah. This is just mad. It was cuckoo. But we had to do it, Phil, because there were 15 people involved. It wasn't just the five people in the band. There was a road crew, there was the lighting. There was this. Yeah. And it was just, a, 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 because we were so popular... It was just a, a, a money-making machine. Yeah. We didn't really see much of the money at all, but everybody everybody else got paid. I mean, I didn't realise at one point we had a sound engineer. We were paying him £1,500 a week. Wow. Honest, this is in the 80s. God, I said, yeah, it's a lot of money in the 80s. I was 80s. getting nothing like that, nothing like it. And I thought, this is all wrong. No, no. And I talked to Mickey a few times about, why don't we just back off a bit on the tour and spend more time making fantastic music, you know, records. Yeah, yeah. But we couldn't do it because everybody depended on us and the, the, the management and the agency. We were getting offers to play. We played, when I say we played around the world, we played everywhere. We did India. We did Australia twice, New Zealand. Uh, all the Iron Curtain countries. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, that's right. Wasn't everywhere, it? everywhere. But anyway, getting back to the writing, 
Um, I start, uh, Mickey asked me if I'd got anything for Raging Silence, and I'd, I was signed to Rondor Music at the time, publisher. Yeah, I know. Which was great. Yeah. It enabled me to, they gave me some money to live, to feed myself and my yeah. wife, and I was able to go in the studio in Wolverhampton at Mad Hat any time I wanted to, and I'd wait until I got three songs. We always did three at a time. Yeah. And I'd wait until I got three times, three songs, and then I'd speak to Paul Hudson, who, who was absolutely fantastic helping me with everything. Yeah. Uh, with, you know, the keyboards, the drums, the, you know, programming everything, engineering, the whole thing. And we'd do three songs at a time. Anyway, I was signed to Rondo, and Mickey Box phoned me, and... Um, he said, oh, we're doing an album, a, a, you know, a new album. Have you got anything songs, song-wise that would be suitable? And um, it's Blood Red Skies, was that, was it? Oh, Blood, Blood Red, Red Roses. Roses. Blood Red Roses, yeah. And I, I hadn't got anything, yeah. but I literally wrote the song for them. Wow. And, and the way I used to write, because I, I, when I stopped in 92, I, I, that was the last song that I wrote. I haven't written a song since. But anyway, um, the way I used to do it, I would play the chords into a ghetto blaster, you know, just, yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. And then I would, I'd, then I got a, war, a Sony Walkman, and I put the Sony Walkman between the legs, and I would play. If I put the power chords on first, I'd put the arpeggios and sing. Yeah, and that was it. That's that's how I used to write. Uh, and that is that is actually what I sent to Mick. I put all the melody line and everything. Uh, um, but what is really strange is when I told Rondo that Mick had asked me had I got any songs, they advised me not to even bother. Really? That, yeah, honestly. That, that I think it was something like, well, they won't sell that many anyway. Because that, they'd obvi- they were obviously thinking... Uh, bigger fish, if you know what I mean, for me as a writer. That's why, as I say, I did, um, I did, I wrote Easy with the Heartaches for Tina Turner. And if you listen to it, you can, it's easy to picture her singing well, it. Well, I, I can, I can, I can picture her singing it. I can picture bands like Heart covering your songs. Yeah. I can imagine Paul Stanley from Kiss covering your songs I, and because there were those outside writers uh, for, for a lot of bands during that period there was Holly Knight Diane Warren Desmond Child yeah. and I can imagine that maybe Rondo was thinking that you were going to be the UK version of, of those guys really. possibly possibly yeah but anyway so so I hadn't got a song they didn't want me to uh, I'd, I'd got some songs yeah but they got a, tr- a cheap trick where I, I got one of my songs on hold in other words they were but, yeah, they, that would have been brilliant. I'm holding it for them for, for cheap trick. Yeah. Anyway, so I thought, and I, and I love Mickey, and I love the band, and I love everything that we did together. Uh, anyway, so I, I literally wrote Blood Red Rose. It took me two or three days, and I wrote it. Um, and that, that was pretty much the start of it. Uh, also, a, a contributing factor would have been my guitar playing got better. Yeah. Because I was playing guitar, my old Telecaster, I was playing every, you know, six, seven days a week, all day. Wow. And, and with, with, with writing songs, it's almost like a little library. I'd get a little bit of a, something going on and think, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. And then I'd sort of stick it in, a, in, my, in my brain. It was like a little filing cabinet. And then I'd <laughs> find another piece and i think, well, that would fit really well with that. And I was so influenced by, like you just said, Hart, Foreigner, Brian Adams, the, the whole thing. And I, I just loved all, all, all that, that kind of music. And, and uh, as I say, after Blood Red Roses, I, it came so easily for me. I don't mean quickly, but it, it, what I did do, I, I'd listen back and i think, bloody hell, did I do that? It was, almost, it was almost like somebody had taken possession of me and thought, right, we're going to write a great song today. And, and that's what it was like. And um, I, I signed, a, a, I did a thing, a couple of records with Mickey Most, yeah. who didn't really get the rock thing, didn't want me to be the rock side of things. Yeah. Uh, but I got these songs, and um, as I say, it ended up, I, got, I re- actually recorded at Mad Hat, over a, I think it'd be about three year period. Yeah. 
maybe a little bit longer, all those songs. And there's, there's not 11. There's, there's more. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, that was going to be one of my questions, Peter, is that yeah, there must be more than 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the next one, next one come, is coming out in May. And it's just, a, it's just an extension of what you've just heard. Same formats, same... All completely different songs, like Easy with the Heartaches. There's a thread going through them, but they're not similar. They're, they all, they all stand up on their own. Well, I think that, that one of the one of the things about a good song is a song is a song that could probably be, be sung in any genre by any artist. And I think, although I said at the start, this is probably one of the best AOR melodic rock albums. That, that's been undiscovered for all this time. I, I can imagine that these songs could be pop songs. They could be made to be even heavy metal songs. They could be. They're, they're so. Oh, yeah. they're, they are. There's so much room to manoeuvre on with this music. I mean, it, the, I mean, in the last ten years or so, from Sweden, we've had band people like Jeff Scott Soto, Eclipse, uh, Heat, W E T, and all, and and they all play this melodic rock music now, which has come back in favour in some territories. And this, yeah. and your your songs, um, are just. Are just are just magical, really. I mean, you're things like you. t- take another look. I built this yeah. house the last time. I, 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 I just I could just reel them all off. I mean, the other thing that because obviously building up to this interview, I've been playing a lot of your hip music, especially from your era. Yeah. Is that if if you'd kind of made this album and you'd still been with the band, it would have it would have just flowed on from. I'm from Equator, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, looking back, um, the fly on the wall, I mean, people said, do you, do you regret this and do you re- regret that? I've never really regretted anything. Any band that I've joined, I've never regretted. And when I've yeah. left bands, uh, I've, I've not regretted that either. But it would, looking back now and how successful this album is yeah. um, worldwide, it would be really interesting to see because it would it would have been in a different format. The, the songs probably would have, well, they, without a shadow of a doubt, they would have been heavier had we done it with him. Yeah, of course, yeah. You know, um, well, it would have been one hell of an album. Been the next album. Yeah, it's just it would have without been one hell of an album. Without a shadow of a doubt, easy with the heartaches would have been the oh. next heap album. It, well, it, well, it's, uh, exactly. And, and, and thinking about that, it may well have done it. It may well have done it because, as you, you you quite rightly pointed out, they're proper songs. They'll stand up. You can do. You can sit and play them on a piano. You can play. You can give them to Kiss, and they could play them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, it, it would have been very interesting to see. In fact, I keep every, every not every time, but when I'm doing these interviews, and I'm going to do it now, I keep. I said to Mickey, they should do They'll Never Find Us. You yeah. lie a heap should record it. Yeah. I know that Bernie will probably not want to. Uh, not that there's any problem between me and Bernie, but it's just, it's just, it's a vocalist thing. He doesn't want to sing anything off a of bombing He just, obviously, he wants to sing the stuff that he wants, that he feels comfortable doing. Of course, yeah. But in so many interviews, I've actually said, I told Mickey to do it. I said, listen to that song. And I said, just picture, don't listen to what I've done. Picture how you would have done it as heap. Yeah. And uh, I, so I'm still hoping, I'm still hoping that they'll do, because it's got all the, it's got the same ingredients as, as Blood Red Roses. It's got that theme, the guitar theme. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's got it's, the big hook, the whole the whole thing. But as I say, um, I think they would do an absolutely fantastic job of it, which they did with Blood Red Roses. Funnily enough, when Blood Red Roses came, when uh, Raging Silence came out, my brother, I can remember it as though it was yesterday. It was a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. And I think it was Johnny Walker or some. Anyway, my brother phoned me. He said, "You stupid git." <laughs> and I said, what's the matter? He said, have you heard the Heaps new record? He said, it's going to be a smash. He said, Johnny Walker's just played it. And uh, he said, you shouldn't have left, you shouldn't have left. And I said, it's all right, Roy, I wrote it for him. <laughs> <laughs> 
But well, I suppose I mean, in, in a, the one thing I, 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 interesting to know what you think is in the in the sixties and obviously seventies, the UK exported all of its rock music. We were seen as the leaders in rock music, so you know the, the Zeppelins, Purple, Sabbath, Laura Heaps, Wishbone Ashes, and all the rest of it. And we, we were seen as to do with like rock music the UK was seen as the leading light. Now, in the 80s, it kind of shifted, and AOR, or melodic rock, came from the USA. Yeah. And my, my, my kind of gut feeling is that people just expected it. Like, my friends used to go through the import racks at Virgin looking for new American bands to, to discover. And any kind of homegrown AOR or melodic rock band seemed to see it was seen as if oh we don't the UK can't do that as well. I remember the ah uh, yeah you're right. You know you're there right. were bands yeah. like there were bands like Shy from Birmingham and you you sang backing vocals on one of their albums yeah, and they did. never quite broke through. And and, and there's a band called. What was that? What, sorry to interrupt you. What was that great band from Birmingham? Five seven oh nine. Oh, uh, C- City Boy. Yeah. I mean, they should have been massive. Yeah, they should have been massive. They yeah. should have been absolutely massive. But yeah. like you say, it's almost as though, well, it's like the blues, you know, unless you come from Memphis, you can't, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, because there was a band called Strange Ways uh, from Scotland, I think, and they were like... They're, they're, one of their albums is one is, is an undiscovered melodic rock gem, but and it made me think of your album because there mm. it, there is some similarities. But going back to your I heap, because when Abominog came out, obviously it had the most heavy metal looking album cover of all time um, with that monster. That on was the front. Bob and Lee. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, because they've just come from Aussie. <laughs> I, I mean, I I I don't. I, I had no idea about the album cover. And, and really, if you look at it, it's, if you look into the eyes, it's not so scary. It's actually a chimpanzee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can it's, see that it's, now. It's, a very, it's got a very kind eyes. But yeah, that, that was, um, it was... It worked for us. But it was misleading. It, it, it was because it kind of, I thought, I remember seeing it and thinking, oh dear, uh, and, and thinking, oh, I know what this is going to be like. And I was so wrong. Yeah. I was so wrong. I bought um, a Bombing Junior, which was the single EP. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant. And then when I heard the album, I thought, this is like, this is a masterpiece this, of a melodic rock, you know, mm-hmm. and it is an absolute. Absolute classic, and obviously relaunched the band. Yes, and because obviously they, they've been struggling for for a while, but this really put you back on the map. And and the follow up, head first. Yeah, I, I loved even more. You know, I well, thought, do you know what? I've never understood. What, I don't know what went down. I, I have no idea. I was too busy singing. Yeah, in, you know, and 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 making sure that my voice was in in good, good shape as much as possible. But why on earth we didn't use Ashley Howe for the... Th- what a stupid, stupid thing to do. Mm. We'd done Abomino, which was massive. Yeah. We'd done Head First, which wasn't as big as, but was so well respected. Yeah, and, we, and we've got this thing going. We were there. We were there. And then suddenly, we're not using Ashley Howe. And I, I just don't get it. But at the time, I, di- I didn't really question it if you know what I mean I was too busy getting on trying to write songs and trying to keep my voice in shape you know I was doing my side of the bargain kind of thing uh, and I just thought well they must they must know what they're talking about oh this guy's work with Mutt Langer you know and it's like wow yeah but it didn't work it did not work and, and going you know, th- Ash, Ashley was a I've always said this and I'll always say it Ashley was the sixth member of the band Mm. And we should have used Ashley. I mean, there's no doubt about it that you're our heap on a roll at this point. The, the, yes. the, the press, which had always. They s- loved us. Yeah, they, exactly. I was going to say. Cause I remember the, doing. We yep. did Castle Donington. Um, that would that be 81 or 82? Yeah. 82, uh, is it? Yeah. Uh, we stole the show. We didn't hang around to watch the, the other bands, but I can remember I, w- I was in JB, you know, JB? Yeah, in JB's Dudley. in Dudley, yep, yep. The week after, I was in JB's, and it was like everybody was just all over me. I mean, <coughs> the magazines, I yep. think it was Sounds at the time. Yeah, that's right, yeah, Sounds and Kind. We yeah. had the best light up. You could, it, it was as though we paid somebody. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic saying that, you know, 
we had the, we had the good, I can remember starting the wizard, it was just me and an acoustic guitar, the wizard at Donington, it was like, who would dare to do that? Yeah. But we did it, you know, it, 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 it was it was planned, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Which, I know Everybody you goes on, when you do a festival, they just go on there trying to take no prisoners. Yeah. And it was like, well, we won't do that, we'll just go on and do it. And we'll, we'll do, you know, what shall we do? In the, we, I think we've got a half an hour, 40 minutes, something like yeah. that. And and it was raining. It had just, I can remember, it just started raining. And um, I can, do you remember Morris Jones? I do, yeah, I do remember yeah, Morris Jones. Morris, yeah, because, uh, I mean, uh, Morris went back with me to Fable Days, you know, well, Astra Agency and all yeah. that and the other. And, uh, and it was just, it was just great. And Morris used to get us some bookings, you know, the Ship and Rainbow and all, all yeah. the local gigs and whatever. And I can remember it. <laughs> and we were wa- we were literally walking. I got I was under an umbrella, walking on, and he he, he come walking over to me. He said, "I've got put a, 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 he said there's a gift in your caravan for you, and it was like a plaque with all the bands and all yeah. that on it." Yeah. And, and he said, "Well done, Peter." And I, it, it meant so much to me because. Yeah. It just from from Donington. Within two weeks of doing Donington, we we because we, there's so many um, European press there, you know, in the press. Pit. Yes, of course, yeah. Uh, it was just out of. It, I, I thought, Christ, I think we might have cracked it here. <laughs> it was great. It, it was absolutely fantastic. Well, yeah, you because know, you the you are a heap prior to all of this had had hard time with the press. Oh, yeah, yeah, and people just didn't believe in the band, and and, and your your period, these these three albums, you know, even in the CD reissues, you know, there's there's clippings from the Kerrang and that, and Derek Oliver and Jeff Barton yeah. saying that saying I can't believe it, but this is probably one of the best rock albums I've heard, you know, for years, and it was your heap, and it, the the other thing I want to say, Peter, is that because I've listened to um, Hold On by Trapeze, which was one of your first big. Uh, albums. Yeah, yeah, my first big gig yeah. after Glenn. Yeah, after Glenn. <laughs> so you've, you've followed in some big footsteps with uh, foot um, shoes with 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 vocalists. But, oh yeah. But yeah. but what I want to say is that when I listen to Easy with the Heartaches, especially as I've listened in in each album in turn, is how much your how strong your voice and and distinctive it had, it became with each album, and to you know so that you this. You know, easy with the heartaches album. Your voice is just immaculate. I mean, um, it, it sounds great on the other albums, but you, you really. You know how much it costs to do that album, Phil? No, I don't. Less than five grand. <laughs> wow. I'll, don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, I won't <laughs> tell, tell anyone that. <laughs> honestly, honestly, the, the 11, is it 10, 11 songs or 10 yeah, songs? 11 songs, yeah. I worked it out. It's less than five grand. Well, the, the, the production you know how much is fantastic. It's quite a cost. No. Close to a hundred grand. Good God! <laughs> I mean, it's just laughable, and it, it, I'm just so. Th- I can talk like this to you because, as I said before, when I was singing, yeah, I, and and they played stuff back to me, and and I, I, if I walked into a club or whatever, and, and they were playing something that I was singing, I always felt a bit uneasy, yeah, a bit uncomfortable. You know, like losing your collar. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know. I don't, I don't feel that anymore because that guy was then, and I, and this is me now, and I'm completely separated from it. And so I can listen to it like you're listening to it, yeah. and I can think, wow. I, I listen to um, the vocals, and I listen to some of the phrasing, and I just start grinning, and I think, wow, that's really good. Yeah, because if it had have been the next year I Heap album, yes, it would have been perhaps a bit more rocky or heavier, but it would have been probably the, one of the best albums of their career. Um, as it is, as it album, would have been the best one of mine, definitely. Well, that's see one thing. I'm, because obviously you came out of Year I Heap and you focused on on song on songwriting yeah. and uh, wonderful songs. But um, the other thing that kind of I, I ponder upon is that if it had have come out. I wonder if would you have been snapped up by another band, because you you know the, a vocalist of your caliber and a songwriting with your yeah, it's a wonder you didn't get snapped up by somebody else. Yeah, I'll tell you partly why. Because 
when I when I decided to leave, we were in Australia. Yeah. And Lee and I went fishing. Right. Well, Lee took me fishing mm-hmm. off the rocks. Yeah. In the afternoon before the sound check, and um, we didn't catch any fish, but I caught laryngitis. Ah. And I lost my voice, and it was really oh, it was so scary, because we went <coughs> we went from the fish we went into the place where we were playing and we did the sound check and I thought something's gone wrong here my voice is gone yeah and I've never had it before ever in my life I've had a sore throat and it's like agony to sing but I could always manage to sing yeah and uh, is it laryngitis where it's just air comes out yeah 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 well I got that and they fetched the, they uh, we had to cancel the gig um and they fetched the doctor, and he said, you've got laryngitis. Now, I wasn't allowed to speak for, for four days. Right. And I was just locked in my room oh, to get my voice back, um, which I did. Yeah. It, it wasn't a problem. We, that was when we did th- um, 36 shows in 42 days. And we were nearly, we, we'd only got about four or five to do, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I had to have four days off. Uh, but we we completed the tour, and it was in those four days that I, I finally, because I got nothing else to do and nobody to speak to. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to. That's when I decided I'm not going to do this anymore. And there was a lot of confusion. Yeah. And because it suited the situation, when I said I was leaving, they all said, "Oh, it'll be it'll be all right. He's just throwing a wobbler. It'll be all right tomorrow." And uh, yeah. anyway, we came home. And then we arranged to have a, a meeting in London. I think it was about a week after, because we, we were due to go to Russia. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's when they went to Russia, which I do. Re- I, I do regret not doing that. Um, but um, we had a meeting in London, and uh, and they finally accepted that I, I, I was going to leave. Mm-hmm. Well, that I'd left basically. I said I'm not. I just don't want to do it. Well, we're going to. Ru- no, I'm not going to Russia. Uh, and because I basically quit the, the, the industry as, as a singer, in my mind at that time, I thought, I'm just going to concentrate and I'm, I'm going to write some great songs. That's what I want to do. That's yeah. what I want to do. And um, I forgot what I'm talking so, about. So, so people didn't see you as a vocalist oh, for hire? No, what it was... Now I'm, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not blaming anybody in the band. Yeah. But there was a rumour that my voice is gone, which was a complete lie. There's nothing wrong with my voice at all. No, yes, that's obvious, yeah, yeah. Because I had this problem in Australia, and because when we come back from Australia, I quit. And because it suited everything, it suited the situation, because why would I leave? Well, yeah, because they've got to think about you know, a story so from their side, it, haven't they? It made it easy for the band. Yeah. It made it so much easier to say, well, Pete's had a... I'm sorry, but Pete's had a big problem with his voice. Yeah. His voice is kaput. It's yeah. finished. But it wasn't. And I think that was partly why I didn't really... I wasn't really approached by anybody else. Because, like you, quite arrogantly, I did think, I'm going to get... The phone's going to ring off the wall. Yeah. But it never rang. The only, t- the, the only time it did ring was um, there was a rumour of, of me joining Michael Schenker. Yeah. Which I didn't really want to do. Mm-hmm. And it never came... To, I, I yeah, was happened. never formally yeah. asked anyway. Uh, and something that I've never really bragged about, um, but it is a fact, it, it's up there on the internet, that um, my name was put forward for Foreigner. Wow. And I can confirm that because I had a meet after I left the band. I thought I didn't want to sing anymore. Yeah. And then I realised I did want to sing. I did want to carry on singing. And I got these songs. And I can remember going down to to Warner Brothers in London. Yeah. And I had a meeting. Well, I had a meeting with a few people. I had a meeting with Paul Birch. And I played him easy with the heartaches. And he turned me down. <laughs> don't say much for Paul, does it? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> but, uh, no, I played three or four of those songs at the time. This was, yeah. you know, that this would be 87, 88, 89. Yeah. 
Um, and I had a meeting with a guy from Warner Brothers. Yeah. And I played him. I can remember it as though it was yesterday. I played him easy with the heartaches. Um, two more songs, which I can't remember. Um, and he, play, he played them. And he said... He said, if I, can get you, if I can secure you the job with Foreigner, will you promise to sign your publishing to Warner Brothers? Mm. And I said, yeah. And I know for a fact that he wasn't the only one. That there was quite a few, there was a German magazine um, and it, there was the, the middle two pages, there was a picture of me leaving Uriah Heap and Lou Graham leaving Foreigner and saying... You know, this is what's going to happen. You know that I would be joining. Um, I was never asked, and I, I know why I was never asked because I would have suited them very well. But Lou got a, a, a higher range than I've got. There's no way I would have been able to sing uh, "Wait for a Girl Like You." I would, uh, unless they changed the key, which wouldn't make much sense. Well, at all. well, well. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that story, um, but. That, that I'd, I'd made notes when I played the album that you know I could imagine Lou Graham singing these songs, and I didn't. So I think you would have um, that would have been a perfect match. Now you you mentioned that Lou and Waiting for a Girl Like You, but if you've ever heard Foreigner live, he doesn't sing it the way it was done in the studio. He actually he takes it down a a, a key. He's never he never really? sang no he never sang that he never sang that. The way it is on the I'm album. I'm not surprised. He I'm never, surprised. he never did that. Well, the live version. I remember seeing them and also hearing the, the li- yeah. live, t- and, they, and they rearrange it for his voice. So he, ne- and this wow. was going back to the time that Foreigner Four, Foreigner Four came out. That so he, he wasn't able to do it live back then. So, but I think that, well, it's interesting. So that that didn't happen. I mean, no. But you, you didn't um, when this when this kind of passed. Did you think, oh, maybe I would like to go after another band or form, but you just decided, no, I'm going to f- focus on being a songwriter? Yes, yeah. Uh, I gave up the whole... I didn't want to form a band from scratch. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, well, you paid your dues, really. It's like, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, just the thought of it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I kept on trying and trying, and I was writing and writing. and But as I say, luckily... I got all those songs, and then in finally, uh, in 1992, um, I decided to shut the door. It was it, it broke my heart, and as I say, the only way that I could walk away was to stop completely. In other words, kill him, kill the monster. So, and, and that's what I did. I haven't. Uh, I, I, I I don't listen to music. I don't play music. I uh, I sold Metallic Aston and bought a sit on mower. <laughs> <laughs> As you do, yeah. As you do. <laughs> and I've got an Echo 12 string upstairs in the spare bedroom that I haven't touched for probably 15 years. And what? What? So, so obviously, it, I... it got to this. That I, I felt that there's got to be more to life. Yeah. There's got to be more to it than me banging my head against the wall. I knew. I knew in my heart and in my brain that those songs were good enough. And I thought, well, what have I got to do? How, how good have I got to be? So, so, you know, the songs. So what happened with Rondor Music then? Were they, did, did that just stop? Did your publishing deal... No, the, it's the usual Peter Goldby saga, the usual, the unhappy ending. The guy that signed me to Rondor Music got the sack and they dropped all the writers. Oh, God. <laughs> So I only got to do my first year. In fact, the girl that wrote, remember From a Distance? From yeah. a Distance. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. Which I love. Absolutely love that song. Um, it was written by a girl, and she was signed at the same time uh, as me by the same guy. Yeah. And I think they dropped her as well. So basically, once we got to the second year, um, they didn't take up the contract. Were you, were you still with Mickey so, Most so, then? But, but obviously I, I, was, I was armed and dangerous because I got all these songs yeah. and I got them all recorded. And uh, as I say, they're only demos. That's all they are. 
they're bloody good demos. They're, they're, but yeah. Paul was just, you know, Paul, uh, uh, most of that and the way they sound is down to Paul. Yeah, I played pretty much all the guitars. The only guitars that I didn't play were the actual guitar solos because I've, I've never learned to play solos. But everything else, all the power chords, the arpeggios, all the little little things, the, all the guitar themes, everything, uh, you know, with me. And, and the, you talk about the vocals. They're only guy vocals. Really? When, when, I, when wow. we did a bombing and head first in a crater, we would spend probably a whole afternoon doing one vocal. When I did Easy with the Heartaches, because I never thought it was going to be an album. There was just songs that I did. I thought, well, I don't want to spend too much time on the vocals because if you make the vocals too good, nobody's going to cover them because when you play them to somebody, they'll say, well, what? I well, won't be able to sing it like that. Well, that's, that's, well, yeah, that's, that's really interesting because maybe it's because... Yeah, John Parr told yeah, me that. Yeah, yeah that, maybe that's really interesting because it means that... Because there's something about these songs and the way that you sing them that they... The, the stories, the lyrics, they sound real, they sound authentic, they sound from the heart, they sound like, you know, that they are, I think, you know, in another interview I read that you said they were like pictures for your ears. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they do, I know that's because of the way you approached it, because all the pressure was off. You just that's thought, well, this is just for me. Uh, you know, and yeah. someone else needs to be able to interpret them. But they don't sound like go- guide vocals. They sound like impassioned yeah, but rock songs. That, I, I've got a head start there, though, haven't I? Because I wrote them. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. I mean? Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you can so many times in history, song, songs songs that have turned out to be massive, massive songs, and then you go back and you you you, you stumble on the original singer that yeah. wrote it. Although maybe not a very good singer, you know, um, by by anybody's stretch of the imagination, but there's something magical about it. I mean, I've heard songs, you know, um, that have been big songs, and then you go back to uh, the original person that wrote it, and there's just something something sparkly about it. Yeah, and you were were you still involved with Mickey Most? How when did that? Did, was... Oh, that was a nightmare. Oh, well, right. <laughs> that was John Sinclair's fault. Yeah, yeah, because he he knew Brenda Brooker, who, who was um, the pub, she worked in the pub, Rack Publishing. Oh yeah, I, I had a, a publishing deal with Rack, um, but he. In fact, I had the publishing deal first with with, with Mickey. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he heard. Um, I, have you heard? I don't want to fight. Yeah. 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 I wrote. I don't want to fight. And um, and I and I'd got Mona Lisa already written. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I tell you the story with Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Mickey Mouse heard the demos. I don't want to fight. Uh, wasn't done at Mad Hat. It was done at another studio. Yeah. And Paul wasn't involved with that. It was right. Another a keyboard player friend of mine. But I love the song. Absolutely love the song. Uh, and Mona Lisa, we'd done. Uh, that's a co-write with Robin. Yeah. Robin George. Oh, yeah. And um, we did we did that at Robin's house. He got a he got a, uh, a studio in his house. Yeah. And I did the vocals in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember it so so clear. Um, and Mickey Mouse heard those songs and he loved them. And we went in the studio and Mickey re-recorded them and they sounded shit. <laughs> oh, dear. Because he didn't get it. He didn't he didn't get it. And and I, I can confirm that with you because when we did it, when they released I Don't Want to Fight, yeah. it was on Round Table. And Mike Reed, you know, DJ. Yeah, I know, I remember. Who, who, was, actually, who was actually a friend of Mickey's, which yeah. makes it even more ironic. They, I was listening to the... I knew it was going to be on. And uh, um, it was five o'clock on the Friday afternoon, Round Table, and Mike Reed was on, on the panel. And my, they put my record on, and at the end of it, Mike Reed really said, "A smash hit. It's a uh, yeah. A, the vocal is incredible." He said, "But it sounds so dated." He right. said, "It sounds like something from the '60s. The backing track is awful." 
and Mickey pulled the record. Oh dear! He pulled it because he he, he heard what what I'd done in the studio. You know, yeah. like the demo, if you like. Um, and in fact, the um, what's on Easy with yeah. the Heartaches is the demo. Because if I played you the record that we'd, uh, yeah. with Mona Lisa, it, this is, I know I'm switching songs, but it was it, it went for both songs, I Don't Want to Fight and Mona Lisa Smile. Yeah. The demo had a magic about it. Both of those songs, had a, there was a magic about it. In fact, there was that much magic, magic about it, that's why he signed me and gave me a lot of money. Well, they, they, they are. But he didn't know how to... He he didn't hear what Robin and I heard, no. and I can remember um, just after Christmas when they, this album came out, and somebody asked Robin about uh, questions about me. You know, yeah. It was to do with a, an article. Yeah. And and Robin had never said at the time, but when I read the article and Robin's comments were. Uh, Mickey Mouse just didn't get it. Even with a black choir on it, it didn't sound anything like as good as when Peter and I did it in my house. No. And you'll understand that. You know, the, the, the so, you can lose it, and, and that's what happened with the stuff that I did with Mickey Mouse. And um, as I say, it was... I was grateful at the time. There were two records that came out, but, but it, was a, it really wasn't the right move for me. No, and, and it was the only game in town, Phil. No, it's, um, and the fact that I mean, because Robin George, I've also I've interviewed uh, Robin George. Um, a couple, very talented. Very, very talented. And the fact that there's three tracks on this album where you co-wrote them, um, and but the, all the tracks on the album blend together. You can't, you know, they sound the the, the two where you collaborated on fit yeah, in so like well. Album. I said that to my wife. Um, oh, and partly the remastering. It was just, the guy that did the remastering. It's just beautiful. It's it's amazing. It, this, this, it, yeah, and uh, in fact, somebody said to me, um, "Oh, I did an interview for a Spanish Spanish magazine." Yeah, and he said, well, "If you listen to your album with earphones, he yeah. said the placement of the instruments is just incredible." It is. It is. Yeah, the sound stage is just it's immaculate. Now, it, how does it feel to you, Peter, that this album, which has been hidden for so long, these songs, which have now have been released as an album, whereas before you just saw them as demos, which us as listeners, they don't sound like demos at all. They, no. It's out, out the album's gone, across the world, people are ringing you up and people are buying it. And, I mean, and all these, and the, you put down your guitar and you put down your microphone all those years ago. Have you had a situation where people who, who know you, where you live now in Wolverhampton, actually think, is that you, Peter? I mean, do people realise, have you had a, because you've, you've never picked up your guitar for so long or talked about music. Yeah, there must well, be people this, who didn't even know you did this. Yeah, I said this, um, the album officially was released 20, 20th of November, I think it was. Yeah. And I think by, by the end of January, something like that, yeah. people were stopping me in the line. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, when when I when I was supposed to be famous, people didn't do that, <laughs> and now they do. <laughs> Hello, Pete, got your album, of, absolutely spot on, mate. Love it, love it, love it. And it, and I, I, I said to my wife, I find it really strange, really strange. And some of the things that people have said, I've thought, wow, they really care. You yeah. see, when, when I was with Heath, the internet wasn't there. No. I didn't realise that there were all these thousands of people in Spain and Russia and, you know, Australia. Well, I mean, Australia, because we toured there. Yeah. But all, you know, all, all the Iron Curtain countries that was... Uh, that were there and uh, I had no idea and uh, as I say because now I can go on the internet and look and see what people are saying and about me and and, yeah. and it's not nonsense because no. they're saying things that I thought at the time I can remember I wrote Too Scared to Run and I wrote Too Scared to Run I thought how would what would Thin Lizzy do 
And this comment on the internet saying it reminds me of Thin Lizzy, you know, it's too scared to run. No, it's a great, absolutely it's not fantastic a copy. track. I'm not, you know, I'm not ripping anybody no, off. No, no, not at all. Whatsoever. But I thought, I've got to have that guitar thing. I've got to have that da 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 You know, and so that guitar, and, and, and it, as I say, it, had I known there were that many people that really cared and had that those songs been released or escaped even at the time, I think things would have been completely different. I mean, it is a bombshell for you. I don't even, I've, I've only told the story twice. Um, yeah. When I was 60, yeah. my mother told me that my dad wasn't my dad. Right. It's only 10 years ago. Right, gosh. And my my brother's father, is, my, we're only half brothers. It broke my brother's heart. Yeah. I, I've dealt with it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my mum's passed away now. Yeah. But <clears throat> my real dad, who I never met, yeah. was a singer. Right. And that's. And had I known that. Yeah. It would have changed everything. Because I, I, I always thought, where's all this coming from? Yeah. I've got two other brothers that can't sing for Toffee. Yeah. You know, so where did it all come from? Yeah, my, my true father was a singer and he played the piano. So that's where it all came from. Yeah. And it, it, do you see what I'm saying? It all, I do. It, it, it all begins to make sense. That's what I was supposed to do. And I walked away. Had I known, I'm, I'm pretty much 99.9% sure I would have carried on and thought, well, this is me. This is, I've inherited this. This is part of my genes. This is who I am. So, so, so I've been in denial for 35 years. Well, and, and very true. And I think that's a, it's, it's an amazing story and it does bring it all together. But now, now seeing what's happening and seeing how much people do care and how much the the albums that you've sung on mean so much to people and especially this new one that brings everything together has it not kind of made you think maybe i could go into a studio and pick up my guitar and write another song no 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 i made a promise to myself when it was over it was over and i would never ever ever do it again well, I guess... And it, I know it sounds melodramatic, but the no. good news is there's another album and it's as good as this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so. I mean, when you made that promise to yourself, you had no idea that this was around the corner. Oh, no. Did you? No, not, the... a, not a clue. It's really strange because when I, when I stopped, I didn't even talk about music. People that we know now have no idea what I used to do. Amazing. I mean, we, my wife's into, obviously <clears throat> into horses, yeah. And uh, all the people that we know had no idea that I used to sing. No idea whatsoever. It's like, and now we, when we go anyway, it's like, you bastard, <laughs> you never told us that you used to do that. <laughs> I can, I, here's a story, and I keep, I keep meaning to um, email Mick and tell Mickey the story, yeah. because we, we were at a horsey do. Yeah. So it's only club level. We don't do anything, you know... Massive, yeah. Not like Bruce Springsteen's daughter. Yeah. Um, what Lynn does is on, only club level. But we we were at a clinic. Yeah. Um, last year, and some people that we knew we were stood. My wife was in the clinic, and I'm there just watching. Yeah. And there's there's about half a dozen people with me. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know who they were, but the one couple I did know, and this woman named Denise. And she said, what's that group you used to be with, Peter? Because uh, uh, th th there was a couple with them that yeah. were big fans, uh, big music fans. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it, she said, what's that group? Uriah something, wasn't it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, Uriah Heap. And this couple just came to life. Wow. Really? Really? And so... Um, at the end of the lesson, so we stood there for about an hour talking, and um, and this couple said, and, and, "You know, where did you play?" I said, "Well, everywhere." Yeah. And they, said, they, they 
They thought I was in a tribute you were a heap band. They couldn't believe you in the real one, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, and it's, uh, I keep meaning to, I keep, in fact, I'll do it. When I come off the phone, I'll, I'll email me. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, just so funny. And I, I looked, I just looked at the sky. But that's, that's, that's how it's been. I, I, I don't talk about it. I hate people that lean against the bar and say, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> or do you know who I used to be? Or do you know who my mate is? Well, you know, I, 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 I think, hate all that. I hate it. Well, I think you would. It's be, much more fun when people say, "You never told me you were in a bloody group." Well, yeah, what a, what a hell of a group! Or a few groups. Yeah. Well, it's a it's an amazing album, Peter, and it's an amazing Thank story, you. and um, and I'm so pleased to know that there's another batch of songs waiting in the wings um, yeah. that are going to come out as well. And uh, yeah, I, the, th- the thread's still there. Yeah. As I say, they're all in total. I think there's about. It's 22 or 23. We've you've had 11. I think there's yeah. 10 to come or 11 to come. Um, um, but w- when we... You see, the main reason why we did... You, I don't know whether you know, but the main reason why we did this yeah. is because... I mean, a, it's been bootlegged twice and the, the, the coppers were so bad, it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, and then um, Trevor died. Yeah, and Ken. And Lee's gone. Yeah. Ken's gone, yeah. John Lawton's gone. Yeah. And, I'm, and basically, I'm thinking, I ain't going to be around forever. And somebody said to me, you know what's going to happen, don't you? The minute you pop your clogs, that album's going to come out. <laughs> yeah. That's what would happen. Yeah. And I, and I, and I thought, well, if, it, if we do it now and I'm involved, I can make sure, it's, you know, get it to sound as good as we possibly can, which yeah. they've done. Yeah, they I have. mean, it, it was sent to... Um, Mike, I call him. It's, it's, it's a guy in Boston. Yeah. And and when they sent me back, oh, that that was the, f- the first thing was we couldn't we couldn't even find the the, the, the tapes because Mad Hat had closed. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, and in fact, I've not even mentioned this. I don't think so in any in any interview. Um, when I was offered to do, you know, for it to be coming out and and all that, um, and. Uh, I said to Paul, yeah. you know, where, where are the, where's the master tapes? You know, the, the mixes. And he said, well, I don't know where they would be now. <laughs> said, because Matt, Matt had his clothes. Yeah. And Mark, do you know Mark You wouldn't know Mark Stewart. No, no, no. He's the engineer. He, well, he, he owns the place now. I think Magno owned half of it. Yeah. At the band. Um, and uh, so I f- Paul said, well, phone Mark and so, so, see if he knows anything, you know, yeah. where they could be found. And he said, i got to fit. He said, I know when man had closed, Mark went through everything and he kept some things and he's got them in his attic or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I uh, phoned Mark Stewart up and I said, oh, hello, Pete, how are you? Da, 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 da. And I said, you know, I've got the opportunity to put out, uh, finally, release th- th- these songs or some of these songs. And um, I said, do you, kn- do you know where, they where are. the master mixes are? Oh, God. Anyway, he said, I, let me, he said leave it with me. <laughs> I'll have a look. And it, this went on for four days, Phil. Yeah. And I, in the end, I phoned him and I said, have you had any joy? He said, I have. He said, I was confused, he said, because you said tapes. He said, and I was looking in the wrong Box. Box. <laughs> he said, we did them on Betamax. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, uh, mid-80s and yeah. all that. And he said, I'll send you an email of the titles that I've got. And he, and he sent me this email. And it, can you imagine? Yeah. Hold the dream. I thought, yes. Easy with the heartaches. They'll never find it. And it just went on and on and on. There's about 22 songs. And... Um, so we sent, well, I didn't, but the guy that's behind yeah. all this, the guy called uh, Daniel Earnshaw, uh, who, who has been a fan of mine, but it, it, because I said to him, where were you when I, when I needed you in the 80s? He said, I was only two. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been fantastic. He looked yeah. after me, and he, he sent the, the, the um, 
the, the mixes. Yeah. Because they haven't been remixed, they've just been remastered. Well, it's, just ama- it's just amazing, Peter. But it's dig- just amazing. Digitally, whatever yeah. that makes a difference, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were digitally re- remastered. And when they, when they sent me via email, which I thought was, that was incredible, they, they could actually do that. Yeah. And they sent me this, these songs, and I thought, my God, it was just incredible. I, I, I was as knocked out as you are when I heard it for the first time. It was like, bloody hell, that's me. It's I don't mean, just mean the, you know, the vocal, the whole thing. No, the, the, the guitars. The, they're there, the guitars, yeah, I mean... Yeah, the drum sound. Everything, yeah, everything about everything it. Everything about it. Yeah, but I absolutely love it. Absolutely, and I mean, I mean, what I hope is that this is. I understand and respect the fact that you know you put all this behind you, but I would hope that there's so many young bands and there's so much new, new exciting music that someone will cover one of these. Somebody I will. Think we, yeah. If, if we don't get a couple of covers, I would be really disappointed. Yeah. I think someone's going to want to cover one of these because they are magic, and um, and there's so so many rock. Rock songs get covered. They've been covered before and before, and they're obvious. And but this is like a, a whole new seam to mine <laughs> of of, mm-hmm. of great melodic uh, rock songs that could be pop. Thank they you. could be they could be heavier. They could be lighter. They could be anything. And I can imagine yeah. male, female um, singing yeah. them. They just they're just they're just universal. So I really yeah. do oh. wish you all the luck with this and and the follow up as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wouldn't imagine... Bonnie Tyler would come to mind. Yes. She's still out there doing it. Yeah, that would she be could, good. She could do two or three of them, no question at all. Yeah, absolutely superb. Well, well, Peter, it's been absolute pleasure to talk to you and to hear your story and to, to hear more about this album. And it's uh, it's brought me to life. Yeah, well, I'm. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can. I mean, it's just like just the simple things, like you know, cars slowing down down the lane when I'm walking. The oh cars. wow! <laughs> and I'm thinking, thank you, God, thank you, at last. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I imagine you must have been in a very dark place where you thought I've tried everything I possibly can there's nothing I, right. more I can do and now okay. all these years later the lights have come on yeah exactly yeah but but I was right in one sense when I thought, when I said there's got to be more to life yeah. I was right there is yes <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've had a great time yeah and, and now it looks like you, you can have it all yeah yeah well, well thanks very much Peter and and thanks for for chatting to me and I look forward to hearing the the next instalment um from the from these tapes. Yeah. And if you The next one's called I Will Come Running. Fantastic. And the top, there's a, that's the title song and it's killer. If you, if you like Easy with the Heartaches, yeah. when you hear I Will Come Running the song. Yeah. That will get a cover, I promise you. Oh, I really, really hope that happens, and I imagine it will. And I hope, um, I hope Mick Box gets in touch and says, you know what, Pete, I think we should cover one we've of your songs. Yeah, we've done it. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> Bernie's agreed. We held a gun to his head. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Well, take care, Peter, and I'll Thank talk you. to you very soon. Thanks, Peter. Pleasure's Ta- all mine. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please subscribe and check out our website, nowspinning.co.uk. Also subscribe to this podcast and the YouTube channel as well. And a huge thanks to my guest, Peter Golby. And check out that album, Easy With The Heartaches. You can get it from Cherry Red or Amazon or anywhere. But, or stream it first. Um, you know, we're all about physical music at Now Spinning. And I use streaming as the radio. So go and listen to it. And as I said at the start, if you're into AOR, melodic rock, great song songs, great choruses, feel good music, wonderful musicianship and production, then this album is for you. Thank you and I'll see you soon.